Hi, everyone. We have a very special episode of Keeping Up with the Joneses today, where we are going to be interviewing Dr. Chip Dodd, who has written the book that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. Ten weeks. Yes. Voice of the Heart. So we're super stoked to have him with us answering questions in just a few minutes. And a quick heads up, you guys did an amazing job sending us brilliant questions. Here's the thing. We didn't get to ask Chip all of the questions you sent in. So we'd like to apologize for that in advance. Uh, You'll see why when you watch the interview with Chip. Chip is a man of incredible wisdom and has a ton of experience. So he's the type of person that when he starts talking... You just shut up and listen. And that's what we, we yeah. try to do. Yeah. And he's also quite prophetic. So he actually answered a lot of the questions that were sent in without us needing to answer uh, or without us needing to ask him rather. Yeah. They just were, it was part of when he would start talking, we just found, oh, wow, a lot of things are getting answered just by what you're saying. And so while we didn't get to ask every question, I'm fairly confident we covered most of the topics that were sent in. Yeah. Uh, Because it was also fun for us to read through your questions and realize so many of you are asking the same thing. Uh, So I hope you enjoy that. Before we introduce Dr. Chip, just wanted to give you a quick heads up that this is going to be the last episode of Keeping Up With The Joneses for the summer. And here's why. We started this, uh, well, I was going to say the beginning of the pandemic. A couple weeks into the pandemic. We've we've been doing it now like 11, 12, 12 weeks we've been doing this. Is that right? That's three months? No, I don't think so. Is it that long? Yeah, this is our 12th episode. So we've been doing this for three months. And what we realized is uh, we love doing it. Do not get us wrong. We absolutely love it. But what it means is I have no weekend because we tend to film these like Friday or Saturday. And then Saturday, uh, I'm editing a lot of this. And it takes me away from my kids. Uh, We've got this precious moment. It takes them away from me. Me. Takes me away from her and she gets (laughs) (laughs) And you don't get around. That was a joke, but you are not. You're, You're very, very patient. Thank you, darling. But it's our summer. Our kids are going to be going back to school in a couple of months. I want to enjoy my summer weekend with my kids. Two pieces of good news for you. We're not going away for good. We are planning on bringing somebody on board in the fall to help us with all the production stuff. Because the videoing part, when we just talked to you, that part is straightforward. That's the fun part. It's all the post-production and editing, which is uh, taking a lot. So we're going to have, uh, hopefully, somebody join us in the fall who's going to handle all that. Uh, post-production and also we don't plan on going anywhere we want to do some online live hangs throughout the summer to to stay up to date with us to work out when we're back on air as keeping up with the joneses and when we're doing live hangs online make sure you follow us on you know twitter instagram facebook we'll put a link in the show notes for you to find out how to do that but just want to give you a heads up in case you think we just vanished without a reason that's what's going on behind the scenes yeah we're vanishing with a reason yeah rest (laughs) <laughs> also, Grace Center opens up uh, as a church again this coming Sunday. Yes. And so we're doing a phased reopening. So our lives are about to get a whole lot busier. So hopefully we're going to see you back in the fall. But we just want to let you know where we're going to be gone. And hopefully we'll see you the rest of the summer doing some live online hangs as well. So thanks for being with us the last many weeks. We have had such a blast Yeah. Uh, talking about emotions, um, sharing stories, answering questions. And uh, we're super excited to finish off this series with Dr. Chip Dodd. Yeah, we're so excited that you're here. Thanks for coming. I'm so glad to be with you guys. Oh, we so appreciate you making time out of your crazy busy schedule to come on the podcast. I guess our first question that we want to ask before we get to all our listeners question is, where did you get this revelation from? Like, How did the revelation of the eight gifts, the impairments, the feelings, where did that come from? Tell us that story. Well, I tell you, uh, the the... The short, long story is uh, my mentor in Texas had been in treatment, and she was introduced to the, the, the basic feelings when she was in treatment, and uh, she introduced them to me, but I began to plumb what they meant, where they came from, where they take us, the gifts of them, the impairments related to them, and honestly, um, the revelation was for me. I mean, you know, I, I before getting into recovery, I kind of had this philosophy, be strong in body, mind, and spirit kind of thing. That was kind of the closest I could power get. Power through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, power, exactly. Climb the ladder, power through. Uh, it was really willful and had God as an overlay on it. Ooh. 
But she introduced me to, hey, there's something else you left behind. And, uh, and she didn't use the word left behind, but it's just like these feelings uh, are what we're all running from. So I'm like, wow, oh, got it. And boy, is it, was it true. And so I just sort of stepped in. Uh, my recovery grew like crazy because recovery really is a matter of the heart more than it's a matter of action and, and action actually subsequent to the heart change. And uh, I took off from there, and this kind of mold around inside of me for about eight years. I was teaching, talking, sharing. And in 1991, this happened in 1988, 1991, honestly, the spiritual root system, the kind of the rest of the story, all sort of came to me. Uh, it's a mixture of experience, education, background, getting a PhD, all of it kind of conglomerated. And all of a sudden, the spiritual root system, how feelings connect to needs, needs to desire, desire to longings, longings to hope, how it touches on the Imago day, And then on top of that, neuroscience, you know, 20 years later, climbs on board and goes, oh, yeah, the ancient things are true. Wow. Yeah. So it all is kind of just blessed by it, honestly, by my own recovery. How was the book or the content of the book received like in your professional circles. Like I, you know, it's a model that I love. It's about, I'm not in your world. I'm not in the mental health world. Uh, or, you know, as soon as we start talking about it, the first question is there's, there's more than eight feelings and, and people have a problem initially until they walk, walk through. What was it like for you professionally? How's it been received? Professionally? Well, even not just even pro professionally, it was uh, just it's not really recognized until people began to take the book to sessions with therapists, with clinicians. Wow. And basically said, you need to read this. <laughs> so so <laughs> you need to know this because this is true. Clinicians right. got involved and said, oh, my goodness. They began to gather, gather copies. But in the very beginning, in 1999, 2000, I was doing some, uh, some radio uh, and so like set up by the publisher to introduce the book. And yeah. it was it was landing like a lead ball, just boom, because they would even say, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, Doctor Dodd, what's the what word would you say uh, kind of encapsulates everything you're talking about? And I would say the word surrender, which means to give back over that which you're running from, give back over to God what you took from God, <laughs> which nobody wants to hear. <laughs> no. and, and, yeah, and, and, and they said, well, thank you very much. Click. I mean, it was over. <laughs> I honestly thought the book would honestly believe because of what it had done for me and my, my compelled demand within me to write it, I honestly thought that it would be like a piece of a, a movement, even a reformation. And I remember Sonia said to me, Chip, your, your, your call was to just write it. You were obedient. You, you listened to yourself. You listened to God. You just did what was, you were, had to do. And so you're done. So the, the rest is not up to you. I'm like, okay. And I did not know that not only it wasn't going to make a big splash, but the ripple effect is we're 20 years into this thing. And I have watched in that 20 something year period, I have literally watched our culture shift related to a resurgence or a reformation, a return to how God made us. And in the book, guys, it's, it's all over the world, quietly. It's just quiet ripples that come up on the shore and somebody picks up the shell, takes it home, and, you know, it, it affects their lives. And I've been amazed what God has done with it. I've been humbled by what God has done with it. <laughs> the, the feedback we've got from people all over the world saying how encouraged they are. I mean, it's it's changing lives. It changed our lives. Yeah. It's changed our marriage, changed our family. And, and ironically, as soon as I uh, first read it, I hated it. Like I, I wanted to yeah. throw the book across the room. Yes. It was, you know, ah, oh, it was horrible. Yes. And then I, then I fell in love with it. And I, I think my sadness is I could have missed it because my intellect didn't, you know, I, I wasn't willing to surrender. I was really happy being right and not realizing I was wrong. Yeah. I associated all of those feelings with weakness. I mean, I get asked the same questions a, a bunch about them. How come there are seven bad ones and only one good one? Yes. <laughs> That's an easy answer because yes. we, we've been given eight feelings, eight tools that allow us to live fully in a place that's tragic. And anyone who says life isn't tragic is psychotic 
uh, removed from being alive. Uh, they are on some very powerful drug. Delusional. <laughs> They're delusional. They're removed from yeah. life. And then the thing is, it's it's really kind of a basic thing. It's interesting how we've been trained to hate feelings because feelings are tools that bring us the gifts of living. But there are only three primary colors. There are only basically eight musical notes. Uh, but nobody protests. You know, nobody Isn't says... Isn't that well, funny? They, yeah. Feelings are just like primary colors. They're tools. And if you learn how to use them, you, you become an artist with all the tones and shades of colors and paint. And also feelings, they're, they, they are in and of themselves, they're not moral. Uh, they're, they are uh, like organs of the body. I mean, your lungs are good. Your stomach is good. Your heart is good. Your bladder is good. And if it's healthy, it gives all the right signals. You breathe deeply. You know it's time to pee. That's like you eat and eat healthy things that help the stomach. So feelings are, are more like just, just good as in they're made of nature and, 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 the, and, and nature's God. But the thing is, um, uh, what you do with them is, is what's going, going to matter. But you know, my eyes are good, but I don't wake up in the morning, open my eyes and, and, and cover them, go, oh, I'm so ashamed I can see. <laughs> but we're somehow we're raised to believe that I'm ashamed because I feel. Right. I'm not ashamed yeah. because I can breathe. I'm not ashamed because I can pee. Wow. I'm not ashamed because I can see, but I become ashamed because I can feel. Right. And that's on, that's something taught because I could be taught to open my eyes and hate myself. I could be taught to hate breathing. You know? Yeah. So it's yeah. just proof that 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 the culture we're raised in could be more powerful than the God who created us in some ways wow. by us rejecting how we're made. Let's get, I mean, you're already beginning to answer some of the questions that our listeners have sent in, uh, which I love, and you're, you're dovetailing already. One of the, I mean, the big question, the most asked question that we got throughout this whole thing can best be summarized. It got sent in by many, many people. I'm going to pick Isaac. Isaac, you sent in this question, and his question is, can you speak more to the practical application of feeling your feelings? How do you do it? Is it about a mental game of simply accepting the feelings you're feeling or are there practical things we should do as well to embrace what we're feeling? Yeah, that's, that is a great question. It's a great kickoff question. And it, it, I, I can do part answers or a sort of a, a three-part answer. But number one, we, we are literally born uh, doing three things. And we're powerless over how we're made, but we come into life with knowledge. Right now, that knowledge is not frontal lobe knowledge. It's inborn knowledge of, of how we create to seek relationship, to seek life. Right. A little baby comes into life and they do three things. The, ap, the APGAR, A-P-G-R-A, A-R. They cry out, which means they're expressing being alive, which means to be have feelings and be in need. They're really crying out with fear. I'm no longer where I was and I need to be somewhere else. I don't want to go back there, but where am I made to be? And I know where's the person I'm made to be with. So they cry out in fear, probably even in loneliness. They know to do it. All creation knows to do it. Everything that has animations reaching for life. Then they reach out. They do this thing called reflex response. They literally go, that's not it. They'll say, that's not it. They'll say, that's not it. Then they'll go, that's it. It's called reflex response. So they cry out, reach out, and then take in, which means to bring in life into myself. And that is inborn. It's not conscious. It's not spoken. It's simply that which we're made to do. It's how we are created. And now neuroscience has backed it up to say we're created to find fulfillment through social connection and social contentment. The, the, the spiritual root system says we're created as emotional and spiritual creatures created to do one thing, it's live fully, and we can't do it unless we're doing it so in relationship. So the feelings are inborn. They come before our capacity to think. The feelings are inborn. They're doing what they're made to do. They allow us to cry out, reach out, and then take in what we're made to have to grow into people who can give the same thing we receive. And what's astounding, we're not made to ever leave that behind, guys. Like that, that, that cry out, reach out, take in. That Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you do not receive because you do not ask. He said, ask 
which is cry out and you shall receive. Seek, which is reach out and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you and you can take in what's there to feed you. Mm. In other words, that which we're born like, we're never made to leave behind. But Isaac asked like, okay, but how, but what, what is it? What, what do you do? Well, you feel your feelings, you tell the truth and you give it to the process. God owns the process. Okay, but practically, okay, what do you do? Okay, here's what yeah. you do. Number one, you identify. What am I feeling? That's the first question. What am I feeling? Which is identify. And then the second question, and it's hard to get to. If, you, if you've been raised on a heavy diet of you know, body, mind, and spirit, or feelings or weakness, or don't be a baby, or uh, if you're going to belong and matter, you better you know, shut it up kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hard to know. But the beauty is they're just eight. And so, you know, you can, and you can even ask yourself, if you don't know what you're feeling, you can say, okay, what would a person who's going through this feel? You can guess. Wow. You can picture somebody else's life because a lot of times we're removed from experiencing our own and we can cry over commercials and movies instead of crying. That's amazing, Chip. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. And we have more empathy for others than we do for ourselves. Yes. Especially yes. in the church. You know, deny yourself. How oh, dare yeah. you have feelings? Yeah. Well, we mature out of our emotions, don't we? Or we try to. We try yes. to mature yes. out of feeling emotions. Yeah. And in the book, The Perfect Loss, which which I wrote about the Beatitudes, I, I say there's a big difference between adults and grown-ups. An adult is someone who wears a mask to hide what they never learned. And a grown-up is a person who's remained a child. They grow fully up into how they're created. Oh, Chip, that's amazing. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right, so back. So you're imagining, you're imagining what another human might feel because you can't do it for yourself. That's a great key. What else? What, what other practical steps do you do? You can remember what you can you can identify from the standpoint of remembering what you used to be like. If you could remember what you used to feel, what you used to know before you kind of got rid of you, you can return to yourself. And then, then identification also, a lot of people say they're confused. It's why I'm confused. Uh, and, and so confusion is when feelings are just globbed together. And you think of confusion from the standpoint of a, a different colored yarn, eight, eight colors of yep. yarn. Well, to untangle yarn, you just find one end that, and, and pull. Now, so you pull that one and you can find one that all starts to unravel. So usually it's fear or sadness. Another practical thing is when I don't know what I'm feeling and I can't identify what I'm feeling, what's it like using the feeling sheet for me not to know? Okay. So, wow. Okay. So it's so, and most of the time, because you have to be willing to say it's on the sheet and the number of times over the past 30 years, I've said, it's on the sheet. It's on the sheet. I promise you it's on. No, it's not. Well, what's it like for you, for me to tell you it's on the sheet and you're telling me it's not? And and they and I, right. I say, find the word on the sheet. And they say, fear. Or they'll say, anger. Or oh, frustrated. Well, no, frustrated. Ang- anger. So it, it's <laughs> like, it, what's it like for you not to know? What do you feel when you don't wow. know? And most of the time, a feeling comes with not knowing. And then as soon as you don't know wow. and you find out what you feel for not knowing, you know what you're feeling. Do you hear the paradox of that? It's a big circle. (laughs) Yeah. All of that is stepping outside of yourself to find yourself. Well said. I I wish I'd said, I wish I'd said that. (laughs) That was perfect. (laughs) You can have that for free. I've stolen enough of your stuff. There's one back. (laughs) I I, I ran seven miles and you ran 10 feet and got it it concisely. (laughs) So so the second thing we do after identify is explore. So identify means what am I feeling? An explorer goes and sees. A scientist examines the test tube. So you, when you get to when you get to exploration, you don't say why am I feeling it. Explorers ask four questions: what, where, when, and how. So what was happening when this started going on? What's familiar about this feeling? How big is this feeling? When did it start? How did it happen? Where did it come from? So you're you're actually at you're walking into the journey of your heart. You're actually going into your heart and asking for memories. Where does this come from? What just happened? 
what was happening beforehand. So you become an explorer in your own life, which is taking the 18 inch journey. The longest journey we ever take is not to the moon and it's not to the bottom of the ocean. It's 18 inches below our foreheads to return to how God made us and to reunite. And that's what a person who is uh, uh, living in integrity is actually living what means integrated. Their head and their heart work together, the parent and the child, the, the frontal uh, lobe and the limbic system, the head and the heart are connected so that real choices get made. So anyway, exploration means what am I feeling? Where is it coming from? What's familiar? In other words, you're getting story. Oh, this happened. That happened. Oh, this is so. And then the final thing is uh, express. So identify, explore, express. And express leads us to the question of who. So first we did, what was I feeling? Where is it coming from? And who do I tell? Because we're created for connection. We're created to be known. We are literally unable to live alone healthy in a healthy way. Unable, we can't do it. Isolation is the ultimate punishment. Most people would rather die than live alone. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, expression means who do I tell? And you only tell someone who knows what it's like to have a heart. And wow. you don't tell people who are removed. That's called evangelism. If you want to get your needs met, talk to people who, who know, know their own hearts. If you're going to evangelize, then go knowing that you're not going to have your needs met. You're, wow. you're out there to care about somebody else's needs because somebody cared about yours beforehand. Wow. Yeah. So identify, explore, express for the purpose of getting the gifts. You know, I don't, I don't like feelings. Uh, personally. Yeah. Me neither. Because <laughs> seven of them were very painful and the gladness is scary as heck, you know? So I was like... <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But we do we do the feelings so we can experience the gifts and the gifts are worth the pain. That's beautiful. That journey was just so beautiful, Chip. That, yeah, that explanation. You. You've answered my like next three questions. Sonia says about me, she said, somebody asks you what time it is, you you go describe how a watch was invented. So anything you want to summarize, you go ahead. My favorite description I've ever heard about you is, I think, I forget which one of your staff said it. It said, asking Chip a question is like getting in a car and someone releases a thousand butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. Um, and it's so embarrassing, but that's a beautiful, I love that one. Oh, it's beautiful. You start talking and there's so many other questions that come from it. And you you answer so many of them in the process. But Stanley asked this question, which you have already partly answered. But Stanley's question was, how do you process an overwhelming feeling that is made up of multiple layers of the eight feelings? And you answered that with the, you know, the, the, the ball of yarn of eight colors. But he said, how do you handle processing through your feeling when in the middle of feeling the truth, the feel shifts to another feeling. One thing is, it's really important that we have other people in our lives to, uh, to share with. Uh, Aristotle said that a friend uh, doubles your joys and, and shares your burdens or halves your sorrows. You know, in Ecclesiastes, pity the person who falls into a ditch and there's no one there to give them a hand to come out. So overwhelmed means not capable of doing it alone. Oh. Okay, so that's important to know. And then secondly, uh, I think it's very important to do two things. One is to trust your body, trust your heart. In other words, your heart knows when it's had enough. Okay. Okay, because you're talking, to, Stanley's talking about going to deeper levels where there's more and more. Some people say, if I start crying, I'll never stop. And it's like, no. What's amazing is you'll start crying and your body will stop and at that point, you know, it's time to go eat some ice cream. Amen. Go take a shower, smoke a cigarette. Or whatever. <laughs> but what I mean by that is your body has its own timing, just like a little baby knows when it's hungry and knows when its diaper needs to be changed and cries out, reaches out, takes in the experience of uh, coming back to homeostasis or, or contentment. So your body knows when to stop. And the second thing is, You've got to parent yourself in the territory of, of processing past pain or present experiences that are overwhelming. You've got to be kind. Uh, parents are kind to children who are overwhelmed. 
So number one, trust your body because your body is always your mind, your brain, your heart, that God created us to seek health, seek wholeness. So trust, trust the journey, so to speak. And number two, be kind. I mean, wow. really identify like, I don't want to go there right now. I'm not ready to do that. So just be willing to lean into your life. You don't have to dive in. Because that's like, that a lot of times that's like, that can be like torturous or just trying to get it over with, say you did it. We're made to grow, not not get things to get things over with. So um, bouncing off what you just said, Chip, we actually have a great question um, from Erica that has a lot to do with a bunch of what you said and uh, more specifically fear. So I'm just going to read you the question. She writes, what does letting yourself feel fear in a healthy way look like? I started having anxiety attacks at the age of 12 and a series of major life traumas had has only added to it. When big fears come, I generally shift into high functioning numbness with an occasional outburst of panic. Mm. I don't have a grid for what healthy fear looks like. Healthy fear is a feeling we've been given whenever we're experiencing what we think of as danger. Okay. Now, I'll touch on anxiety in just a second, but but fear is there to allow us to be babies, to be human, to be grown-ups, all three, in a developmental process. But fear is a feeling that's there to let us ask for, cry out for, and reach out for help. Fear is a feeling that's saying, hey, will you help me? And help comes in. Uh, identify helping pe- people helping me identify consequences. Hey, if you go do this, this is probably going to happen. It helps me learn from life to recognize danger, so I don't have to repeat it. It allows me to practice results, like today hooking up all this equipment. This was like hooking up equipment for me, right? It's just like another day for you. So I practiced before you know I got it all set up before we we connected with each other. And I call two guys and say, now, how's this going to work? And what are we going to do? And what is this exactly? I need to memorize. Because I was scared. So I was asking people to help me so I wouldn't get on this with you guys. And then all of a sudden, I get anxious. I go into toxic shame. I just shut my computer and and run home. (laughs) Or just fake it but not be present. Um, Yeah. so, So fear is a feeling that allows us to ask for help. And when help arrives then what happens is we start to develop this thing called trust, faith, and even wisdom. We start to develop this belief that, you know what, I'm not alone. So fear done well, basically allowing me to ask for help from the right people, which means people who understand that you don't fix life, you learn how to live life. Right. There's no fix. There's no place to go to get away from having to be in this struggle. Anxiety, though, is is often provoked and becomes a um, a physiological response to not being able to live in a place where fear was respected. I'll repeat that. That anxiety, especially when kids who are younger and when anxiety becomes pronounced, what it is, it's diagnosing that 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 they're growing up in a place in which fear is not respected as a tool that allows us to grow stronger, that wow. that, 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 that the fear that was spoken was diminished. For example, uh, William, my youngest son, is really, especially in the younger years, was frightened of, of tornadoes. We had a storm, t- terrible storm hit our home, and we had a little tornado room and the door was open, and I was the last one to get in. And when I was sitting on the edge waiting to the last second, he was saying, Dad, get in, Dad, get in, Dad, get in. I said, William, I will, I promise, I will. And, and fortunately, I didn't need to. I mean, the storm passed through. The house was intact, damaged but intact. A month later, storms were coming through again. I was watching the weather upstairs. He comes upstairs, and he's pulling on my pants. I'm watching the weather, trying to get a sense of when it's He said, Dad, Dad, Dad. I said, William, wait a minute. Dad, 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 please, Dad. Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be bad? Dad, he was being in need. He was being in fear. 
He was being in, uh, depending on me. And then he said, Dad, stop, Dad, please pray. Dad, please pray. Dad, please pray. Dad, what's it gonna be? I mean, he was just, he was, he was being himself. And I took my hand and kind of like swatted his hand. William, stop it. I'm trying to watch the weather. And then I got a grasp, not realizing what I was doing. And then I turned around, he wasn't there. He'd gone downstairs. Wow. He was gonna to have to take life on by himself. His fear was judged as ridiculous. He still had the fear in him. He was hurt. When I went downstairs, I said, William, I, I, I am so sorry. He said, never mind, Dad. I'm like, uh-oh. So he, mm. his hurt was clearly, Dad, I don't trust you right now, and I'm embarrassed, and you humiliated my vulnerability, and I was just being what God made me to be. I was even saying, Dad, pray. And you rejected the most vulnerable experience a human being can have, which is say, would you pray for me? Would you pray with me? Mm. I am so scared. The, the man who's there to always pray with him swatted his hand. Wow. Like, 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 which was a go away message. So what's, what he's left to is, is because fear isn't working, isn't alive. The body, remember we mentioned earlier, is always seeking homeostasis, is seeking health. So his body has to take over to try to do what his emotions are made to do. See, his emotions are made to tell, me, tell him to reach out to me, but now anxiety has to take the place. He's got to handle it by himself. That when fear comes, it turns into the threat of helplessness, the potential repetition of being swatted away and, mm. and, and, and to wind up alone. So anxiety is really a, 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 a rejection of the voice of the heart because when you had your voice, nobody listened. Wow. Wow. So, you, you, so anxiety is an expression of helplessness that we have experienced before. And usually it's old stuff. So, uh, and, and, but then if we're in denial and we can't pinpoint where the story began, we assume something's defective about us and that's where the panic, the panic attack comes in. Wow. I'm, I'm alone, I'm gonna die, no one's there to help me, you know, that whole world. And, and by the way, we all get anxious. Anxiety is part of life because it's fight, flight, freeze. I mean, th things happen in this life like tornadoes and tornadoes are there to bring us to a fight, flight, or freeze experience. We're made to run like crazy or fight like crazy. But our problem is that when it comes to daily life and we have fight, flight, freeze related to daily life, it's about unhealed uh, lack of permission to be who God made you to be in the past. So you were just talking there about like anxiety is always old, talking about growing up in an environment, a family of origin where, you know, your fear is not validated, your fear is not honored. We had a question from Brian. We had some great questions about families and kids. Brian asks, can you share tips about how to help your kids understand and navigate their emotions and feelings well? All of these questions are phenomenal. I recommend that he uh, get the book Parenting with Heart. Right. Because the, I would say the number one recommendation I have for parents uh, raising children is to remember what it was like to be a child. Oh. <laughs> what if you don't? Then, then, then you will you will accidentally uh, squash your child's feelings because you're going to be rendered helpless. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're in therapy. <laughs> yeah, welcome to our club. Uh, you know, that's all of us. Because I mean, listen. Number one thing is every parent is going to harm their children. It doesn't make a difference who you are, saint, whoever. You're going to harm your children. Uh, and that's the beauty of remembering what it's like to be a child. A person who's doing everything they can to run away from having to be human, they're also running away from the most beautiful thing that a child knows how to do. And uh, wow. human beings, uh, the beauty is that we're capable of seeking forgiveness. And that's the that's two things of a parent, remembering what it was like to be a child and staying in contact with the feeling that of guilt, of knowing like, oh gosh, from the standpoint of empathy, when I was a child, that would have really hurt me. 
when I was a child, that would have really rendered me sad. When I was a child, I would have really gotten that that kid is scared. Like when I was a child, I would have really wanted to pull on my daddy's pants and say, daddy, 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 daddy. But at a young age, I learned to don't do it. Now, if my rules of don't do it become my children's way of functioning, then what I'm doing is I'm passing generational pain onto the children. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if I'm able to identify my feelings, have explored them, and, and, and have processed with other grown-ups about them, then I can hear that child because I was one, and I can respond accordingly. And if I don't, I'm capable of recognizing that and going to that child and saying, I'm asking you to forgive me. And you know what children are hungry to do? Reunite, reconcile, right. yes. come back. Yeah. yeah, they're great at it. Absolutely, because William needed to sit in his hurt like, I'm done with you, Dad. He needed to be able to keep his hurt to see if I would really pursue. And a parent really has to know what it's like to be, remember what it's like to be a child to parent a child. You can't give what you don't have. Wow. The gift of God in children is that they want to know what was it like when you were a child. Like all the stories my children ask of me is, tell me a story when you were a little boy. They love it. And that's God's gift of getting me to remember what it was like to be a boy. Oh, that's a great example because they're asking the question over and over again. You you remember what it's like to hurt? You remember what it's right. like to laugh? You remember what it's like yeah. to be sad? Tell me a story yeah. about bravery, how you overcame, all how your broken time. heart healed. Yes, that is so great. And in fact, you know, I say this a lot, unless a person can tell their story and the feelings that go with it, you you probably need to know that they're not very safe people. Wow. Unless a person can tell their story and the feelings that go with it, then they're probably not somebody that you can be close to because they're shut off. Right. So there's the gift that parents can give children, and it's the gift that children are seeking parents to get back, like you just said. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Here's a question that would go along with that, Chip. Like, so I, I'm somebody who can tell my story to adults. I sometimes struggle with, like, because our kids, whenever we go camping, we're sitting at the campfire, they're like, tell us a story about when you were little. Well, my childhood is not really a nice story. <laughs> Um, it is not even PG-13. It's, it's not. It's dreadful. And uh, I don't have very many nice memories to tell. So I've told the nice ones. But I'm I'm also, we're sort of in this stage where, you know, we have a we have a 13-year-old and we have an 11-year-old and we have a 7-year-old. And they're all capable of probably processing different things. So like the 13-year-old actually knows that my dad killed himself. She doesn't know that I tried to. So I'm sort of like, with that kind of stuff, like I don't want to traumatize my children by telling them what my childhood was like, but I also do want to validate them, make them feel connected. I, you know, but I, I, I don't want to make up stuff either. Stories uh, are like books. Uh, they take a, a, a long time to write and... Uh, a long time to read. And so you said it beautifully, 7, 11, and 13? Yes. And those are all developmental chapters. And the seven-year-old chapters are very different than the 13-year-old chapters mm -hmm. and are going to be different than the 18-year-old chapters and the 22-year-old chapters. Mm -hmm. Just as your life is unfolding, you're unfolding your life backwards to your children. And uh, my sons, both of them, uh, were, I believe, uh, it's like 16 and 18 before I said, oh, and here's the rest of the story. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. And they knew, you know, grew up in addiction and what the results were and the recovery. And, but all along the way, I'm validating their feelings, but also uh, having some boundaries. And, you know, honestly... One of the sort of the end of the story that reintroduced that introduced them to me before they knew me. Okay, it was amazing that uh, I had gone on a retreat with my youngest son, and he asked me a very challenging question, <laughs> and I 
just, uh, just, I, I said, Hey, you want some more, uh, uh, you want some more chips and dip? In other words, like, I, I no. And, and, and so he picked up on, okay, I'm going to drop it. So I thought, okay, I'm out of this. And then the next morning, the kids know they listen, they pay attention. And if they're alive in heart, they're going to come back around to ask again. So the next morning, he, he came back to the very topic that I had successfully avoided. He said, Dan, what about so-and-so? I'm like, hey, William, let's sit down outside. And so we started talking and then uh, we came home from the retreat, which I considered a disaster. <laughs> but it was like a disaster in God's hands. And in God's mm. processes are so scary because we don't we have oars in the boat, but we don't control the water. Right. No, we can, we can, we can, but it's the river. The river yeah. is what we've got to navigate. And I got home. I called Sonia and said, Hey, look, Sonia, um, here's here's what's happened, and uh, it's time for all of us to talk, for them to know what what you know, and for them to know, you know, the rest of the story. And what was amazing was my my one the, the oldest son said to me, he said, Dad, that's how come I believe in the Bible. I'm like, oh. what? He said, because it's about real people living real struggles, struggles with real redemption. And wow. he said, I don't even know the man you're talking about. And I don't oh, know. Man. I don't know that man. So, yeah. so I think the stories need to be told and, and God will bring you opportunities. You'll seek wisdom as when. But wisdom, yeah. wisdom just means knowing when. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's some special moment. Wisdom's all about timing. It's yeah. kind of like, and, and life will bring it to you. God will bring it to you and you'll be ready when it's time. But yeah. I think Beautiful. like what, what, what you brought up, um, I think kids, kids need to know not every detail, not where we slip off into our own trauma that's unfinished. Yeah. But the stories of our lives, they need to know because we're still here and we yes. endured. Because they need to hear yeah. the perseverance, the redemption, the reconciliation, the strength that came from sorrow. Yeah. Mm. Even though the sorrow never ends. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. yes. I think I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I know with with Abby, when when I did tell her, I didn't I obviously didn't tell her details or anything like that, but just sort of I was with her and she asked, and I was like, I was just like checking in with Holy Spirit, is this gonna be good? timing for this yes and I felt like he said yep and so I just sort of very generally explained uh that what my father had chosen but with with Tia because she's a lot younger and she's very connected to all of her feelings yeah, yeah. all of the time which is totally fine I didn't feel like you know as a 10 year old at the time you need to know this information so I don't know if I did the right thing but I was just like Hey, I don't think mommy's really ready to talk about it yet. Would it be okay if we waited until you're a little bit older? And then I answered that question. And so she said, sure, mommy. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And, and like you, 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 you did relationship. You sought the Holy Spirit. You listened to like your spirit uh, in conversation with the spirit, you know, you sought help and you, you trusted love you also trusted the developmental capacity and discern differences between your children. I mean, look at how much is happening. It's amazing. And then you took the risk. And with the other one, you had a boundary. Mm -hmm. And all she needs to know is that you're present, you're going to stay, and that you're her mommy. She, she, she just needs you to be yourself and, and have an identity. Yeah. And you had the identity of saying, you know, let's talk about that at another time. She said, okay. In other words, and she trusts that you will. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah I feel better. Good. <laughs> but that's beautiful. I mean, you know, you, look, look, you've you have uh, gone through a hill, and the child walked and lived and survived and now thrives, and so you can tell the story of how you are here, and that's going to be nothing but testimony in the future. That which was once your shame will be your victory, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and your children sure. your children will admire you. Thank you. Okay, so this is a great question. Um I'm going to pivot slightly to a the spiritual aspects of some of the emotion type questions. Great. So 
Um, this question is from Will, and he asks, uh, I believe Father, Jesus, Spirit experience all the emotions and show us how to live fully from the heart. The one that causes problems for me is God feeling guilt. Guilt seems to be predicated upon sin. Yet God also seems to express guilt, regret in scripture. What's your perspective on both God feeling all the emotions and guilt specifically? Okay. This is beautiful. I've been doing a lot of um, uh, Isaiah 30, 15 says that in repentance and uh, rest is your salvation. And then it goes on to say in quietness and trust is your strength, which means in all cases, dependency, turning away from self-will and coming back home, come home. Because in repentance and rest is your salvation. The word salvation is Yeshua, which we as Christians know is Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's Yeshua. Come home. Come home to how you're made. Come home to who you're made to be. Come home to whose you're made to be relationally. And come home finally to what you're made to do. Like with total redemption. And so repentance means just putting down, putting down warfare, just putting down uh, my own way, putting, putting down that which I'm running from, sometimes because we're sick and tired, sometimes because it's not working. Mostly it's because we're just tired. Otherwise, we won't repent, you know, but coming home. And what was amazing was Jesus is like us in every way, except one way. He never needed to repent. So Jesus no, had no guilt. How come? Because Jesus never left home. Now, what I mean by that wow. is, it doesn't mean, oh, wow. he, yeah, he, and it, this is amazing. So you go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he in the Garden of Gethsemane, here's our living proof of how he's like us and yet he never left home. The word that is described to him is agonista, that he was in agony. Jesus, our Jesus God's son, our savior, clawed the ground and weeping. And he begged God. He was so afraid. Jesus was so afraid. He said, God, please, 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 please. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. God, please, please. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Do we have to do this? And he said, I don't leave my friends. I've got friends, God, especially three of them. They're just wonderful. And I really want to stay with them, you know, his inner circle. And, and the people, uh, it's, it's going to be painful, right? It's going to be terrible. And God's going to, it's going to be so bad, Jesus. In fact, it's going to be so bad. There's going to be one moment that it's going to, it's going to just be so bad for both of us. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And, and, and finally it came to, do I have to do it? You know, with this, this cup, your will be done. Do I have to do it? God says, yes. And Jesus said, okay. Okay, for the joy set before me, but please, God. I mean, that was uh, uh, the one who never left home. He, he never mm. left connection. He walked through everything we walked through, but never left connection. So he never had guilt. So he never had to repent because he always stayed in the connection of dependency upon God, right. something we can't do. So God has no guilt, but God can have sadness. God can have regret. Jesus had fear. Jesus had anger. Jesus had loneliness. I'm a man of sorrows. And think about this. Jesus was always getting away. He was always staying connected. I mean, there was lots to be done, but he, I mean, he was like a, a bad employee. I mean, if we had hired him, <laughs> you know, if we had hired him, we would have fired him. It's like, hey, you're, you're off the job. You're, you're just walking away from the clock. You know, what do you mean you're yeah. eating at 10 o'clock? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm kidding, I'm being ridiculous, but he would often go away to pray. And he 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 dropped the 5,000 to go with the 40. I mean, he had his chance to really do mass distribution, you know, to fix everything. And he said, no, no, no. So uh, the question of God's guilt, uh, God can have, I'm sad that I made man from Genesis 6. I see what they've done with my creation. But see, God is our God, the ultimate shepherd, he never stops asking the first question he ever asked, which is, where are you? And the answer yeah. 
in the book, the Holy Scripture, the answer is emotional. The answer is emotional. In other words, sharing of mm -hmm. the heart. I was afraid, mm -hmm. so I hid. I took my mm -hmm. need, I took my feelings and was silent. I took my needs and went into denial. Instead of, I took my feelings and cried out and used right. my feelings to find the rest of me to tell you about it. So our struggle is between hiding out versus crying out. Our daily job is to cry out, meaning feel your feelings, tell the truth, and give it to the process. And God owns the process. So, I mean, God had no guilt. Great answer, Chip. So good. Thank you. So good. I have another question from a spiritual perspective. This is from Marissa. Marissa asks, how can you tell a difference between an emotion that's truly an emotion versus an emotion that also has a spiritual component? Like with fear, what are some signs that what you're actually dealing with is a spirit of fear and not just the feeling of fear that has a gift within it? You know, I think that the, the spirit of fear becomes uh, actually what is uh, a chronic anxiety. Okay. okay? Um, and, and God cares about our anxiety in First Peter 5, like 6, 7, and 8. It's not about your anxiety is a sin. He says, cast all of your anxiety upon him because he cares mm -hmm. for you. And see, anxiety is about I'm going to wind up alone, helpless, alone. Right. And be, you know, gotten, whatever that means, gotten, humiliated, uh, strangled, died, killed, whatever, helpless. But God said, everything that, that you care about, anything that bothers you bothers me. Right. In other words, you're not alone. But it, he goes on to say, but but beware, you know, brothers and sisters, for the deceiver prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, anyone, indiscriminate. See, the first part says he cares for you. The second part, the deceiver just prowls looking for meat. And what's amazing is lions hunt the same way hyenas do. They hunt for stragglers. Lions and hyenas do not attack the herd. This is a case in which this is in the line of Judah. This is just the animal that, that seeks, that preys on the, the victim. So well, what, what is it that makes a human a straggler or a, or a victim? What happens is when we don't use our voices to stay connected to others in God, that's when we become stragglers. Wow. So the spirit of fear, I think, is predominantly anxiety that doesn't translate into neediness. Anxiety that does not translate into neediness. So a spirit of fear becomes anxiety-oriented and controlling in nature. You haven't been given a spirit of yes. fear, but a spirit of right. courage, which means full-hearted participation, a willingness to speak what's happening inside of you. And because you know you're never alone, you will dare to step out even when it looks like you are alone, that it, it dispels what the spirit of anxiety or the spirit of I'm, I'm by myself. Um, Great answer, Chip. Yeah. Another, another thing too, by the way, is that fear, healthy fear, prepares us for battle, prepares us for daily life. It, being in need, asking for help, practicing results, getting prepared. Fear gets you ready for daily life or ready for battle, but anger takes you to it. Anger actually takes you to battle. See, anger is the action emotion, not rage, but anger. Anger, the gift of anger is passion, which is a willingness to be in pain for something that matters more than pain. You haven't been given a spirit of fear to let fear control you. Fear is there to prepare you to get ready to go do what matters to you. Right, and if you if you're in in intimacy with God, and you know that God has done done for you what you can't do for yourself, you want to when you see other people suffering like you once suffered, you can't help but want to say, "Man, you don't have to live like this." And then somebody says, "Well, get away right. from me, get out of here." I'm like, "I'll leave in a minute, but I'm going to tell you something first. I was once you." And see, that's the spirit of fear is not in control, anxiety, control, you know, uh, uh, having to be. Uh, Direct, direct by environment is what anxiety makes us do. That's the spirit of fear. Brilliant. Wow. How are we doing? I think I've got time for one more question. Is that okay? Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm loving it. Hey, you know, if it's up to me, we'd do all day. <laughs> we'll do it next time. This is a great question, Chip. And, and to see where our thinking leads us. So 
I think for me, out of all of the feelings in the book, the one that I wrestled with the most and had the most gladness about once I think I understood your revelation was, was shame. And so the, the beautiful gift of shame is understanding I, I'm, I'm human. I've got limitations. I've got glorious gifts and wonderful limitations. And it allows you to show grace. It allows you to have grace for yourself. Like, I'm, yeah, you're, you're right. I, I am limited. In community, you get to have an appreciation of that same grace for others. Like in the same way that I'm limited, AJ's limited. Uh, my parents are limited. We all have limitations. <laughs> At what point does the the grace that we show to others turn to enmeshment or codependency? As in, my my grace for you, Chip, it then excuses your responsibilities because I'm, I'm saying, oh, well, you're just limited. Th- does that question make sense? Yes. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll need to do a whole other podcast on that one let's do it okay (laughs) yeah i'm serious let's organize that i'd love to do that but okay so healthy shame is a willingness to uh acknowledge being human and as a human have feelings about being human and the impact of other humans on me and impact of me on other humans okay so that is the capacity to have mercy about limits, but also the capacity to have boundaries. In right. other words, like, look, I didn't do this. I did this. I mean, I, you, you know, I, when we use, when a healthy shame becomes toxic shame is when we end up saying, you're limited, I'm limited, and therefore I have no boundaries. Right. Be- because I'm limited I shouldn't have any feelings, shouldn't, should. I shouldn't have any feelings about this. Well, the truth is I was with this beautiful couple this morning before we got on. And uh, he is work addicted. And below that, he is validation addicted. And below that, he's control addicted, okay? (laughs) Well, that sounds like a party. (laughs) Yeah. And the guy is amazing. He's brilliant. He's fabulous, and he grew up as a tortured soul by a father that just did not care. I mean, really, like, just didn't care. So he, he she says, you know, I know, I, 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 he said, I know he can't help it, okay, where he grew up and how it happened. And I'm saying, that's correct. He has an addiction. And I look at him and say, and you didn't cause your addiction. Nobody plans to be a slave to these things that you can't help. You can't stop. And he says, but I apologize for my addiction. I said, you can't. You you didn't cause it. You can't apologize for it. However, you're responsible for dealing with it. And so to the spouse, what do you feel about him having an addiction? Well, I feel angry. What do you feel about being angry? I feel ashamed. I feel like I shouldn't be angry because he can't help it. I said, that's correct, he can't help it. However, it's his responsibility to deal with that he's, it's not his fault, but he's gotta deal with it. And I look at him and say, it's not your fault, but you got it. It's like diabetes or cancer, you got it. Now, what are you gonna do about it? And it, you could be angry at his addiction without being angry at him. And you could be angry at him for not dealing with his addiction. So healthy shame permits the truth to be spoken in all of its inglorious glory. In other words, she she can have her feelings and have boundaries and still have mercy. Right. And if she chooses not to have feelings about that, that's when you're moving into codependency and enmeshment. Well, it isn't his fault. And, you know, I don't have a right to be angry about it because you don't know how hard his childhood was. And so you start making excuses rather than recognizing it's a limitation and you're allowed to have feelings about that. Yes. You know, my recovery is very much connected to, um, honestly, I used other people have it worse almost to my own death. Wow. Wow, you're a good Christian then. Exactly. And so I didn't have a right to have feelings or a right to have pain because of other people's pain. Yes. Yes. So my toxic shame worked into I shouldn't feel this 
I shouldn't be like this. I should be all mercy and grace and goodness yeah. and be stronger than other people. So w- when it finally came to me that my I'm created to feel, and I was always ashamed of being human and ashamed of having feelings. And the, the the enmeshment you're describing is like this woman who would, let's say she would say, well, I shouldn't feel this way about it. What we're really doing is running from contempt towards ourselves for being human. Right. A person who's a caretaker, enmeshed or a hero is contemptuous towards themselves for being human. And so the moment, the moment they don't have mercy, but instead have anger, the moment they don't have grace, instead have hurt. The moment they have a boundary, instead of being a, a per, you know, uh, what's it, perforated. The moment they have a, an identity or a boundary, they see themselves as bad or guilty. Wow. So, so the caretaker, the enabler, and the hero are all sick people who are ashamed of having their own needs. And I keep that, that's me. Yes. Oh, what a great place to end. Well, Chip, thank you so much for coming. Oh, and- AJ, I loved it. AJ, thank you. Yeah, and Alan, thanks for inviting me, you and AJ. Thank you so much. I love your show. Oh, um, it's such a pleasure. I'm still like all weepy-eyed. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to cry some afterwards, um, but mostly gladness. So th- thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for giving up your time, also putting your life's work into these books. Um what can we do if people want to get more of you? Like, where do they go to get more uh, Chip Dodd? Uh, they can go to chipdodd.com okay. where there are podcasts. And also, uh, uh, and go ahead. And it sounds so self-promotion, but get the books. Get the books. Yeah. Get, do. get Needs yes. of the Heart, Perfect Loss. And then Hope in the Age of Addiction comes out, uh, I think, July 20th. And okay. that's going to oh, cool. be, I think that's going to be a pretty profound book, even though, the publisher would not let uh, me or Stephen go all the way with it, but it's it's going to be a pretty profound book talking about the the pandemic of addiction, which is wow. uh, that which competes against how God made us. It's what addiction is. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Chip, for being with us. We so appreciate it. We'll put a link in the show notes to everything that uh, Chip just mentioned. But we appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for being with us and with our listeners. Thank you. I appreciate it. So big thanks to Chip for being with us. A big thanks to everybody who's been listening and everybody who's been with us these last 10, 11, 12 weeks. I've completely lost count. Yeah, thanks for all your encouragement and your feedback. We've had a lot of fun on this journey with Mm -hmm. you. And we look forward to being with you in the fall. We pray that your summer is glorious, that it's restful, and that you're recharged. And this whole work that we've been doing in Emotions produces huge dividends for you, your family, and your community. We look forward to seeing you in the fall.